welcome the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope you're sheltering in place in a comfortable environment. We look forward to bringing you back into the Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. In 1348, the bubonic or Black Plague, as it was mostly known, killed half of Europe in a matter of months. It changed the course of history, and it may have introduced and given birth to the Renaissance. In 2020, what are the lessons we can learn from this event half millennium ago? After beginning his career as a professor of medieval and Renaissance history at the University of Maryland, our speaker today moved to Silicon Valley, went to work for Steve Jobs. After 17 years as a venture capitalist, our now San Franciscan spends most of his time on angel investing. Before the COVID-19 hit, he spent many extensive trips to Europe, and he's written two books about Italy in the Renaissance. And so Ron Wiseman, PhD, historian and venture capitalist, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Ron, thank you very, very much. It's great to be back at the Yacht Club, and uh, my family actually has been in San Francisco through multiple disasters. We were here before the earthquake and fire, uh, so uh, have real, re really, really deep roots in this community. Uh, it's a pleasure today to talk about a, a very tough subject, um, the Black Plague, the Renaissance, and us. So imagine, imagine that 50% of the population dies in a few months. Imagine roving bands flee war, famine, climate change, and disease. Large processions uh, encourage mass self-flagellation as a prelude to mass murder. And revolutionary movements try to seize power in town after town across the continent. So what happens when their world is turned upside down? We all have heard of the 1918 flu pandemic that killed as many as 50 million people. For all its terror, it had few lasting effects on culture and, and society. The great influenza isn't something our parents or grandparents mention much, if at all. We're gonna to speak tonight though about an earlier pandemic that had a profound impact on its society. And it still evokes horror when we learn that the bacillus still lives among us. If you wanna catch the plague, go up and visit Truckee. With influenza, we say it's, oh, it's just the flu. But no one says even today, oh, it's just the plague. Let's, our agenda for today is first looking at what Europe was like before the plague, during the plague, uh, after the plague, and how it impacted the Renaissance, and then turn to us. What, are, what, are, what will these pandemics and, and other disasters mean for us? There were three great black plagues. Justinian's plague uh, in the Byzantine Empire, uh, 1541 uh, to 750, which killed between 30 and, million and 30 and 50 million people. Our focus today, the Black Death, which killed 50 million people immediately. And a, a more recent pandemic that started in 1855 with around 12 million deaths. So the Black Plague has been with us over and over again. What was the world like before the Black Plague? Well, the cosmos was viewed as a, as a really a divine hierarchy as symbolized by Dante's, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, as Dante's cosmos in the divine comedy. That's the most elaborate description of the medieval worldview that we've ever had. So feudal society is divinely ordained and divided into warriors who protect people, priests who pray for people and peasants who feed people. Political authority is divinely ordained, and life is a pilgrimage from sin to salvation, where the clergy has a really important role, mediating between man and God. God and the saints are very active in this world, in this drama of salvation, and uh, there is something we call the economy of salvation, uh, where the poor pray for the rich, and the rich upkeep the poor. Key personal and social ideals were the Franciscan St. Francis's ideas of poverty and humility. The Dante's Divine Cosmos is illustrated here in this painting by Domenico di Michelino, uh, which illustrates the, the Divine Comedy. Hell off to the left punishes sinners according to the nature of their crimes. If you commit violence against your neighbor, 
you're going to boil fraternity in rivers of blood. In the middle is the mountain of purgatory where the pilgrim does penance for the seven sins, deadly sins, leading to the Garden of Eden, uh, and then paradise and the heavens, the celestial spheres, which influence the fate of man. Off to the right is Dante, standing outside the walls of Florence, uh, because he was exiled during one of Florence's periodic civil wars. This is perhaps the most complete vision of the divinely ordered cosmos of the Middle Ages. But Dante is a transitional figure. He also points forward, not just backwards. He wrote in Italian, uh, and his, his books are filled with intimate portraits of his friends and his enemies, where individual personalities are as sharply drawn as any Renaissance work of art. Before the Black Plague, Europe had experienced rapid population growth because of an agricultural revolution between 1000 and 1300. Europe had 80 million people, it grew threefold, 90% were tied to the land. But Northern Italy was a bit different. Things were already changing, uh, particularly in the Italian city-states that were self-governing merchant-run communes. Foreign commerce, cloth, and, and, and banking industries dominated and thanks to capitalism, uh, Northern Italy was the strongest economy in Europe, and there was a growing interest in new ways of seeing the world from an urban layman's perspective. I'm going to switch here to a little, a little look at Ita Italian art styles to see the difference. This is a traditional Italo-Byzantine style of Mary the enthroned ruler, done in about tw uh, 1228. She's majestic. She's eternal. The gold in the background symbolizes divine light and wisdom. The style is iconic. It's eternal. It uses the two most important colors in medieval art, gold and aquamarine blue. The blue symbolizes royalty and majesty. Uh, these are not human-scaled figures. They're trying to make the point. If you look at, at Mary's hand, she is pointing at the philosopher king, the infant Jesus. Her fingers are elongated to be like a signpost towards Jesus. So that is the traditional way that Italian art was figured uh, up until the, the early decades of the, of the uh, 14th century. Uh, if, uh, if we move instead uh, and look at uh, just a, a few years later uh, to Giotto, uh, the Lamentation uh, in, the, uh, in 1303, you see um, a, an amazing lifelike view of, of, of Mary and, and her dying son. Uh, you, you, you see um, a full three-dimensional view of people who look like human beings. They're not flat against a flat representational surface. Uh, you see them fully come to life. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Giotto, uh, one of the greatest painters of, of the uh, early 14th century. So here we see, again, another Giotto, what I call the birth pangs of a new culture. It's naturalistic. It's exploring human emotion. It's more historical. Um, it's less eternal. It's vernacular. And you see growing self-confidence uh, of, of the ability to portray man in his natural, humanistic, historic uh, background. What you see here is the kiss of Judas. Uh, Amicus meus, me trotted osculo, my friend betrayed me with a kiss. A perfect metaphor for the, the intimate and agonistic life in an Italian town where your friends, your neighbors, your family are also your competitors and your enemies. And uh, a, a single act of familial or neighborhood violence could trigger a vendetta or a civil war. And here you see Giotto really understands the dimensions of treason as well as love. The early 14th century um, was a time that I call confidence shattered. We see some growing optimism. We see works of, of Giotto and Dante and showing more confidence about a humanistically portrayed view of the world. Then along comes the crisis of the 14th century, which, uh, which starts in 1315 with a great plague, with a great famine uh, that, that wipes out 10 to 15, maybe 20% of the population. Up to this point, Europe had been overpopulated. The climate change causing a little ice age, causing things like famines and war. At the same time, where do you go to for, for, for solace? You go to the church. But the Pope was both a spiritual and a temporal ruler. 
Urbi at Urbi, city in the world. The Pope had his own armies and his own territory in central Italy. So he was seen by a, as a political figure and was in conflict with King Philip IV of France, who in 1309 kidnaps the Pope and takes the papacy to the French town of Avignon for the next 67 years. The papacy returns to Rome in 1377, but the cardinals are factionalized. And there are now two popes, a French pope and an Italian pope, causing the great schism, which is not healed until 1417. The church is in disarray. It loses moral authority and is widely held up to ridicule for corruption, for vanity, and for worldly power. Just read Boccaccio or Chaucer, uh, but you want to see how the late 14th century thought of the church. Well, let's return to commerce. What made the city-states of Northern Italy great was its international commerce. And you see here the Venetian and Genoese trading rates, trading routes linking uh, places as far as England all the way up the Silk Road uh, to China. Our story begins on the Silk Road in the town of Kaffa, modern Feodosia in Crimea, where a Genoese colony uh, was, run by the, was run by the Italians in order to trade with China. There was a protracted siege of the city in 1346 as the Mongols tried to kick the Genoese out. Uh, and uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the uh, Golden Horde's troops were not winning the battle until many of them caught a strange disease and as a last resort, tossed the bodies of their ill over the walls uh, of the Genoese colony. And of course, this was the Black Plague. They infected the Genoese uh, who fled on their boats guess where, back to Italy. So let's spend a minute talking about the Black Plague. Uh, there are three types. Uh, there is the bubonic, which is based on the bodily swelling on uh, the groin and armpits, large black swellings called buboes. Uh, there's the kind of plague that attacks the bloodstream, and there's the most violent kind of plague, pneumonic plague, which attacks the lungs and is passed by bloody coughing. The plague is passed uh, to rats uh, by fleas. Uh, and the, the plague bacillus lives in the bloodstream of the flea, uh, the, the uh, looking for food uh, and always needing, uh, needing somewhere to expel uh, the, the, the bacillus uh, from its bloodstream. The flea bites a rat and the rat becomes contagious. So if you, if you catch the plague by flea bites or handling rats, uh, that transmits plagues to humans there are three days of incubation, and typically after that, three to five days from the time you start showing symptoms, often that bodily swelling until the time you die. The mortality rate, if you caught the plague, was 60%. It was carried long distances by, uh, by sea and traveled essentially about a, about a mile a day by land. Uh, so overall, it's 23 days from the first time an infected rat shows up uh, until you see your first community death. You can see how the Genoese carried the plague first uh, back to Italy, those brown areas, uh, places like Sicily, uh, then to, uh, to northern and central Italy, uh, to Genoa, to Ancona, to Rome, to Florence. And by 1349, it spread to Central Europe. By 1350, it had spread to Eastern Europe uh, and to Russia. Uh, so the plague devastated virtually all of Europe. So look at the devastation of the plague. Just check the population of England. Population of England before the plague was 4.8 million people. It dropped to 2.6 million uh, by the end uh, of the decade of the plague. And by the end of the 14th century, by 1400, the population was under 2 million. So more than 50% of the English population dies and does not recover for 300 years. We're going to spend a lot of time in Florence this afternoon. Uh, so Florence uh, in 1342 uh, had a population of about 120,000. Um, it was devastated uh, by the Great Famine. I'm sorry, in 1330 it had about 120,000. It was devastated by the Great Famine uh, and it lost about, uh, about 20,000 of its, of its people. Population was 100,000 before the Black Death. Immediately after the Black Death, the population was cut in half to 50,000. And further incidents of the plague 
reduce Florence's population to 40,000 by 1427, the year of its great census. So within 100 years, Florence had lost two thirds of its population, not atypical. How did the city react? Well, much the way we are, uh, by lockdown. So as uh, Marco di Colpo Stefani says, none of the guilds in Florence were working, all the shops were shut, taverns closed, only the drugstores and the churches remained open. If you went outside, you found almost no one. Sound familiar? One of the cruelest things the plague did in the 14th century was devastate the young. Uh, and this was one of the reasons why the population of Europe was slow to recover because uh, it, it more than decimated. It uh, didn't kill by 10%, it often killed by 50% of those most able to bear children. Unusually, women after the plague were healthier, freer, but shorter. They had higher mortality uh, during the plague. Uh, in non-plague years, more men died than women. In plague years, about 12% more women died than men. But those who survived were healthier. They had better diet, they had better health. We'll explain, explore that in a few minutes. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, 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 London uh, graveyards indicate that, they were, that women born after the plague were shorter. Why? Because healthier diets um, uh, uh, led them to, uh, to go into puberty earlier and puberty apparently uh, uh, slows down, uh, slows down the, the growing process. You're pretty much done in and around puberty. So early puberty uh, made women shorter. But there were more opportunities for women. They could own property, they could serve in guilds. Well, how did the healthcare profession react to the plague? From uh, ancient, the ancient Greek and Roman world um, until, the, until the present, uh, there was something called the humoral pathology, which was the basic theory of medical science developed by Hippocrates. Uh, there were things that were hot, wet, cold, or dry, uh, there were four humors for, for personality types, melancholy, phlegmatic, sanguine, and cholera, uh, choleric, uh, and there were four elements, fire, water, earth, and air. And the intersection of these uh, determined health. How did you diagnose health? You did by reading pulses and by looking at urine samples, and also by looking at signs of astrological disorder because the planets influenced the four humors the four seasons and the four elements. Treatment involved restoring balance of four humors by bloodletting and leeches and purging. Physicians were mostly academic theorists. Barber surgeons were the actual clinicians. And medicines were based on visible similarity to affected parts of the body. The strongest reaction was the best reaction. So this is how the, uh, the, the uh, 14th century, 15th century dealt with the plague. Even up until the time of Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton, uh, there, there were attempts to, to treat the plague uh, by things that looked like the plague or, or, or the opposite of the plague. So uh, Newton considered uh, curing the plague with toad vomit lozenges. People who go to Truckee, please take note, you may need them. One of the leading professors of medicine, the Fauci of his day, was Professor John of Burgundy, who was on the faculty of Liège University's uh, School of Medicine in 1365. He says, everything composed of elements is influenced by heavenly bodies whose motion creates the bad air which corrupts the body via evil humors. Physicians ignorant of astrology can't treat plague victims as astrology is a science vital to physicians. Well, what about basic things like anatomy? Anatomy was known from Arab medical texts and the first public dissection was in Bologna in 1281. But Western medicine emphasized philosophy rather than lowly empirical observation. And the church outlawed the desecration of the body in 1300, about 50 years before the plague. At Europe's best medical school, Montpellier, there was only one autopsy course every other year. The medical faculty of the Sorbonne even declared the practice uh, of surgery uh, to be illegal. So uh, we've got a rather different medical culture. Uh, and the plague was often, was often uh, parallel to the biblical plagues visited upon the Egyptians, a punishment sent by God. And even some radicals said that the plague was a good thing, a test of sanctity, a way of being tested by God. So the diagnosis of the plague, as we've seen, was influenced by astrology, which was a key part of the medical curriculum.
as Boccaccio said, no doctor's advice, no medicine could overcome or alleviate this disease. And Boccaccio notes, not only were there, quote, real doctors, but also the rise of quacks. Here you see a real physician taking a plague victim's pulse uh, and uh, the use of good air to drive out bad air, the use of flame, for example, and smoke to drive out bad air. And you see at the bottom right, someone carry an object that would, it would contain powdered flowers, good sense, pushing out bad sense. Well, the plague was not a one-time event. The plague was a recurrence uh, between the 14th and the 17th century. And here you see the major epidemics of plague. So the plague recurred on average every decade or two, three times a generation. And some have argued that the primary shift in Europe's mentality happened after the second outbreak, after 1360, when people realized that the plague was here to stay. Towns like Florence and Venice, and Pisa did, uh, did develop plague boards. They started death registers. They did use the practice of anatomy to understand early onset of the plagues so they could take collect collective action. Infection was a common fear, and there was a theory of contagion that developed in the 16th century, but, but 200 years after the plague. Quarantines, uh, the 40-day period, that's what quarantine means, a 40-day period for travelers arriving in Ragusa or Venice started in 1377 and spread uh, across Europe. Led to improved sanitation, uh, the combating of miasma, bad air with sweet air or burning air, led to public surveillance and tracking, improved gate security and health checks in walled towns, and mass burials, as you see here uh, in Venice uh, at the bottom right. The top right is a lazaretto, uh, a special hospital for plague victims. This ultimately led to the isolation, unfortunately, of the poor. The plague became an important part of popular culture, as Shakespeare says, a plague on both your houses. He was born a year in which the plague killed a quarter of the population in his town. Uh, he suffered economically when the plague shut London theaters for six months. Then again in 1603 to 1613, uh, the, the plague shut theaters like the globe 60% of the time, uh, leading, leading Shakespeare to move from, uh, from uh, uh, theatrical works, from drama, to poetry. In 1606, his landlady died. And even, uh, even in Romeo and Juliet, we see the plague. In Romeo and Juliet, uh, Father uh, Friar Lawrence sends Romeo a letter telling him that Juliet had faked her death and was awaiting his return so they could flee together. But the messenger stopped in a town on the way to Rome, and the town suffering the plague, and Romeo was placed under quarantine. By the time he reached Romeo, it was too late. So what are the reactions to the plague? Well, I would call them shock and awe. The psychology of after the plague, we were suffering divine punishments for our sins, like the biblical plagues, widespread pessimism, fear, and helplessness. We have no idea what this disease is or what to do about it. Half our population is dying. We had extreme sense of guilt, a need to expiate sin, and a fascination with death, decay, dying, and the macabre. So here you see one of the most popular images post-Black Death, the triumph of death, the dance of death. The way we would help was by um, appealing to the saints. And one saint in particular became the plague saint, Saint Sebastian. Saint Sebastian was martyred um, by, by having been shot by arrows. And those arrows in, in the fifth century, but those arrows came to symbolize the plague itself. So when you see the signs of arrows, you see plague. Uh, and uh, almost every major Renaissance artist had his depiction of Saint Sebastian. The most interesting, I think, was by Benozzo Gozzoli. Uh, and here in the middle of the image is, uh, is not Christ. Christ uh, is up at the top with the Virgin Mary. But Saint Sebastian is assuming a Christ-like position, protecting townspeople who believe in him from arrows. And you can see those arrows tossed by angels, those plague arrows, are bent and broken uh, because of uh, St. Sebastian's uh, intervention. Another major image was the, Mer the Madonna of Mercy, where those who followed Mary, who were enveloped by her cloak, uh, were protected from the plague. So you see here Mary's cloak, and you see a fraternity, uh, a men's club, 
uh, and a women's society of nuns uh, being protected. Those outside her cloak are being struck by plague arrows. One of the major forms of literature was the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying well. The moment of death was perceived as being critical to whether you go to heaven, hell, or purgatory. And the typical image was uh, angels uh, at the top fighting devils at the bottom for your soul. What was your attitude? What was your, what was your morale at the point in which you died? Uh, and um, there was a growing attraction to this unmediated sense of self-confronting death, not immediate by the clergy, but by your own interior life. So a major impact here was a focus on interior psychology and personality, uh, self-awareness. The moment of death was this, uh, this battle between good and evil. Among the ways people organized uh, to imagine their lay piety, their personal piety, was lay men's clubs formed uh, as mutual aid or burial societies. They performed plays and music. They modeled themselves on, the, on a family. They were governed by, uh, by a father who would be the governor of the, of the fraternity. There were two kinds, uh, Laudesi, who sang hymns of praise. And as these pra hymns of praise became more elaborate, they turned into theatrical works. And eventually in Florence and Venice, these Laudesi fraternities uh, were responsible for the birth of opera. A second kind of fraternity were the disciplinati, who practiced self-flagellation. They expiated sin by whipping themselves. So the big difference between modern clubs and uh, clubs uh, in the early Renaissance were we don't whip ourselves, uh, at least when we're not on Twitter. <laughs> so the flagellants, uh, those who whipped, uh, were a very popular form of devotion, focusing on self-denial, personal expiation of sin, most visibly in active flagellation, usually with leather whips studded with, with nails or other iron objects. While some of these were performed in private, uh, inside confraternity oratories and chapels, uh, there was also mass movements, mass public processions of laymen whipping themselves into an ecstatic frenzy. And so frenzied and out of control were they that they often degenerated into riots and mass violence. One frequent target, of course, were the Jews blamed for poisoning the wells or using astrology to create that bad air, that miasma. Immediately after the Black Plague, 510 Jewish communities in Europe were wiped out just in two years. And to celebrate Valentine's Day, of course, Strasbourg burned 2,000 Jews and 3,000 were met this fate in Mainz in 1349. Pope Clement VI issued two bulls to try to stop this massacre because he said, look, the Jews aren't causing plague. They're dying at the same rates we are. But the Holy Roman Emperor said, wait a minute. Uh, 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 any property left by dead Jews would, would be forfeit to the local town, creating an incentive, early asset forfeiture, for new ways of mass murder. So this is a world turned upside down. Uh, it, it's, it's a world in which almost everything in terms of economy and society changes. The population shrinks, land becomes cheap, labor becomes expensive, wages rise. Between 1350 and 1450 was the golden age of the peasantry as standards of living rose dramatically, often at the expense of governments and towns. Less labor-intensive food production meant more meat, more wine, better diet. Because land was cheap and labor expensive, falling rents reduced the incomes of landed elites of the government and the church. And massive flows of wealth, massive from the dead to the living. A more income created a mass market for luxury and high status goods, one of the things that propelled the Renaissance. And sudden social mobility, the workers no longer tied to the land, uh, rising expectations, but growing status anxiety amongst the nobles because anybody could now afford to dress like a nobleman and eat like a nobleman, causing the rise of special legislation uh, controlling uh, what middle class, and lower middle class people could buy and wear. This world has shown the death of feudalism um, and, of course, uh, incidences of mass violence. So this is a world in revolt, and you can see uh, re revolutions taking place across the entire uh, spectrum of Europe, from Greece to Russia to France to England. 
And because the, the beyond massacres, European society was openly in revolt because land was cheap, labor expensive, the incomes of lords had fallen. So in Bologna in 1357, uh, to make up for lost, lost revenues from falling land, land rents uh, and workers who no longer wanted to be tithed, Lord Bernabeu imposed on his subjects a salt tax, a tax for grinding grain, a tax for milling, a tax for every 2,000 2, square meters, uh, 20 shillings of, of per year as a head tax, a gate tax, a wine tax, a tax on goods leaving the city, a goods tax on goods entering the city. Uh, and uh, under that yoke, people wrote, you know, rose up uh, with violence and overthrew his rule. In Ravenna, the Lord, uh, the, the local Lord imposed three rounds of taxes in a short period. The people staged a revolt, electing leaders down with taxes, long live the people. And the Lord's two uh, tax collectors were killed on the spot. Siena had six governments in four months. And so urban and rural uprisings were three times as prevalent after as before the Black Death. To give you uh, just three examples, uh, the Jacquerie in France in 1358, uh, after the death of the king, uh, there was uh, a, a power vacuum and uh, in the Battle of Poitiers, uh, the nobles fled the field, uh, leaving, uh, leaving towns and castles uh, undefended. Uh, and there was mass rape and pillage by the by English troops the nobles then demanded a special tax to fortify castles against this kind of looting. And there was widespread revolt begun, as you see at the bottom left, by the killing uh, of a knight. Uh, and uh, hundreds of noblemen were killed. Uh, and, and at the end of this, uh, thousands of peasant revolutionaries were killed in return. Same thing happens in England in 13, uh, 1381 with the imposition of special taxes and even attempts to uh, reinstert, reinstall feudalism and tie peasants back to the land. But their purchasing power had increased by 40%. They no longer felt uh, under, the, under the rule of the lords. And in June, uh, so upset were they by the imposition of these new taxes that they seized the Tower of London uh, and uh, uh, their leader was uh, unfortunately murdered uh, by the, the mayor of London uh, the English king uh, agreed uh, to reduce taxes and eliminate many of these onerous burdens. Uh, but as soon as the peasants left town, uh, he abrogated all of these well, promises and many of the peasants, as many as 1,500 were killed. In Florence, uh, the least prosperous uh, citizens, uh, those who were not members of the wool guild, those who, who were too low on the status hierarchy, seized the town for four years. But based on disorganization and chaos amongst their membership, uh, the, the Trompi revolt uh, was soon put down and Florence's leaders um, determined never again uh, would democracy be so widespread uh, that, and, or people so factionalized that they would allow rebellion to occur. So uh, the town's elites and middle classes unified themselves around patronage networks, the most important of which were by the Medici family which didn't really have power officially, but ruled via patron client systems. So the play generation comes, uh, comes of age, surviving decades of crisis, decades of decline, repeated mass death. Uh, they were fearful, pessimistic, deeply guilty, fascinated with social, political, and ecclesiastical corruption, a deeply personal piety, a loss of confidence, and a desire for a new order. Art after the Black, Plath, Black Death, some people have said it's innova innovation on hold. Back to those hierarchical forms, lots of blue and gold, lots of static images, not the lifelike historical figures of a Giotto, uh, but, the, but, this, but the eternal kinds of figures of an Orcagna. So artists, artists, historians have often called 1350 to 1400 a lost generation. But a new mentality is forming amongst the second generation, those born 1375 to 1400, the second generation after the plague. A desire for practical solutions, not grand theory. A need to reimpose order. The flowering of lay institutions such as confraternities, guilds, and towns. A growing desire to study the natural world and one's own language. A focus on human emotion and human glory, or for the first time, in 
hundreds, maybe a thousand years, it was okay to celebrate wealth and power and status, a real focus on human glory and emotion. Symbolized by Cosimo de' Medici, the most important informal ruler of Florence, born in 1389, as he used to say, give me three yards of cloth and I can make anybody a cardinal. A practical, uh, practical guy uh, who was concerned primarily with earthly affairs. So we see the, the 15th century Renaissance and its values of naturalism, humanism, civic life, and cosmopolitanism. A fascination with the natural world studied directly. A fascination with civic life, with man the maker, man and doer, having an individual identity and personality, achieving a fame by politics, the vita activa. Humanism, education studied up on the, the focus of man through language, history and moral philosophy, best achieved by recovering the Greek and Roman classics. And it was a cosmopolitan culture. Uh, these, the arts, literature and sciences were interpenetrated and the Italian humanists tra traveled from town to town taking up positions as bureaucrats, as notaries, uh, as artists and residents. And they spread the culture of the Renaissance from town to town and eventually to Northern Europe as well. And the culture of the humanists, as I've said, the study of, of man through language and literature. It was the city state, not the divine cosmos, that's the proper sphere of thought and action and honor. An eagerness to experiment piety remains important, but it's really deeply personal. And there was a growing need to balance the old virtues of humility and poverty with human glory and the celebration of wealth. This is a very confident world distinct from the world of the late 14th century. One of the main beneficiaries uh, of the early Renaissance was the state, and something called civic humanism. The crisis of the late 14th century saw depopulation, urban revolts, uh, riots, uh, revolutions, the increasing need for public order, sanitation and defense uh, created bigger states, bigger governments and much higher taxes. Florence went so far as to establish a dowry fund uh, to help finance uh, the marriages of women given, given uh, the, the dem demography of mass plague deaths. And Florence experimented with, the, with, with uh, Italy's first broad-based income tax. You see their income tax form, much like a 1040 off on the right. Uh, they had forced public loans, uh, forced imposition of income taxes on the entire population. And those wealth, those records still exist, uh, enabling us to have an unparalleled view in Florentine society. To manage all of this, a new bureaucratic elite arose of classical scholars uh, serving in chief administrative roles like heads of the civil servants uh, in Florence. They were skilled at oratory, skilled at management, uh, skilled at administration, and they were skilled in Roman uh, and, and contemporary law uh, and uh, uh, because the entire uh, upper classes uh, served uh, in city councils, uh, the humanists educated an entire class about the proper behavior love of antiquity uh, and love of the modern state. So combining eloquence, scholarship and influence, they really melded humanism and politics, creating this thing called uh, civic humanism. And as one of Florence's chancellors, uh, a man of, of little renown from a modest family outside the town who made himself Florence's most important citizen because he ran the chancellery uh, and he became Florence's chief propagandist. He was a model through bureaucrats around across the Renaissance. One of those uh, emphases on civic culture was Florence's commission in 1401 to, to cast bronze doors in the Florentine baptistry. Uh, one of the winners uh, uh, was, uh, was Lorenzo Ghiberti, who won the first commission and it was so beloved he was granted a second commission. Uh, the doors that he created were uh, called by Michelangelo, the gates of paradise, and the name is stuck. So here you see one of his most famous panels, uh, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. And you see his invention of, he's using perspective. Uh, nearer objects are more built out, farther objects uh, have, less, uh, have less relief. He's using the arts of perspective. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, he, uh, because it was a public project and anyone could walk into his workshop and see a whole generation of artists were schooled in new techniques like perspective. Uh, and uh, like the use of relief. 
Masacho, uh, a clear heir to, uh, uh, to Giotto, uh, doing the same thing uh, in, in the painted arts. Here you see his expulsion of Adam and Eve. Uh, and you see Adam and Eve uh, uh, utterly, utterly devastated by their expulsion from the garden uh, with sorrow, pity. The, you, can, you can visualize the horror. Uh, and Masaccio uh, uh, was, became um, a, one of the leading artists because of his ability to detect not only emotion, but three-dimensional spaces, as you see with his, tr with his trinity off to the right. Uh, and, uh, and the world of, of uh, human affairs, as you see in the center. To include a brief survey uh, of Renaissance art, I want to go back and compare uh, that Berlingeri we started with, that Madonna, with Filippo Lippi's similar subject, also an enthroned Madonna, a seated Madonna, uh, also wearing blue uh, in uh, 1460. Her throne, though, is now an intimate household luxury good with rich, tap rich tapestry and embroidery, it's an intimate portrait facing her son, not a regal one facing the faithful as a queen ruler. She's a contemporary noble Florentine. She shows emotion and sadness. She knows what's going to happen to her child. It's a living, it's a static ta tableau where the angels are winking at us. It's a perspective of a three-dimensional living world, a richly detailed human world. And these are the changes that the, the new Renaissance mentality brought to bear. So, did the Black Plague cause the Renaissance? Well, it definitely accelerated changes uh, that were already beginning and culminated in the Renaissance, changes we could see uh, with Giotto. Uh, it uh, definitely created a market for the Renaissance by expanding the urban middle class. It created a need for more robust cities and stronger governments that could patronize the arts. It extended criticism and loss of faith in older institutions like the church and ways of seeing the world. It focused on man, on nature, on human emotion, and self-knowledge, on glory, and on the individual psyche. So um, uh, it, uh, it definitely led the way to the Renaissance, but, but every reaction has a counter-reaction. Uh, and uh, ultimately, the culture wars, not unusual given what we see today, came for the Renaissance, as exemplified by Girolamo Savonarola. Uh, he was a brilliant orator. Uh, he was the Ayatollah Khomeini of 15th century Italy. Uh, he declared Florence and New Jerusalem, a people's republic with Christ as its ruler. Uh, he and his uh, mobs of young men seized control of the town. They attacked urban elites and merchant class for their wealth and for the lack of care of the, of the poor. Uh, and uh, there were mass bonfires of books, of art objects, of statues to get rid of the, vanity, of the vanities and a return to the old virtues of humility and poverty. Um, this was a reign of terror. Uh, he attacked the Pope, so he was excommunicated in 97 uh, and burnt at the stake in Florence uh, in 1498. But he had long lived influence. He, influ he definitely influenced uh, Protestant reformers, uh, who did many of the same things uh, in more, sometimes more moderate, sometimes more extreme form than Savonarola did. Well, I want to conclude, but what about us? Every culture organizes and explains the world through its histories, its legends, its myths, its heroes, its villains, its fears, its martyrs, its conceptions of good and evil, its virtues and its vices. And popular culture does it, um, elite culture does it, mass culture does it, so comparing the Black Death to coronavirus, the Black Death hit once or twice a generation for 300 years. Hopefully the coronavirus is a once in a century event. The population mortality rate was 30 to 50% then. It's less than 1% today. If you caught the plague, you had a 60% chance of dying. If you catch the COVID, your, your chances of dying are are less, around less than 1%. The Black Death was at first a radical disruption, then people learned to live with it and it became an unpleasant fact of life. So far, coronavirus has been the most radical disruption of anything most of us have seen in our lives. Both the Black Death and the coronavirus have caused rigid social control, quarantining, a surveillance society, increased power of governments where heretics of all sorts are denounced. 
the sudden dramatic change uh, from the Black Plague, triggered waves of disorder and loss of faith in the old order, culminating in that new culture, the Renaissance, and ultimately the long-term values of humanism uh, as a cultural force uh, in the Renaissance and in the Enlightenment. Uh, for 400 years, we lived Enlightenment values. But the Protestant and Catholic Reformation ushered in a, a, a contrasting world, uh, also, also waves of violence, beginning with the demolition of statues. And as people have said, uh, setting fire to statues is the short step to setting fire to people. And the second half of the 16th century, the religious wars went from burning statues to burning people en masse. Uh, as many as 4 million people died uh, during uh, the religious wars in France alone. What about us? Well, we've had 60 to 100 years of political and social and cultural crisis and dramatic loss of confidence. We've got broad repudiation of our norms, our heroes, our religious and national narratives. You've got unresolved conflict about the rights of rights and citizenship. And this was all before COVID-19 struck, starting in the 60s and moving, moving since. Even more extreme popular polarization since COVID-19 exists today. And we're now questioning legitimacy of all of our underlying political, social, economic institutions even the ideas of civil liberty and free speech. So a question for you is, will the coronavirus and its aftermath trigger a transition to a radically different social order instead of cultural values as the Renaissance and then the Reformation did? Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Weissman. A uh, few questions. Um, did anyone get cured of the plague? And if so, how did they get cured at all? Uh, probably from natural immunity, natural causes. Um, as far as I know, bloodletting uh, and cupping, the use of hot heated cups on one's back to draw out bad air, none of that worked. Um, uh, but certainly uh, isolating, uh, isolating the ill uh, did reduce the spread of contagion, mm -hmm. if you could do it, if you could do it. But uh, yes, people recover from the plague in the same way people recover from COVID. Uh, we're not quite sure how, uh, but it, it did happen. Of course, it did happen, as the death rate was 60%, not 100%. So what was the state of public sanitation at the time? How often was there running water? And um, was there, can you see any correlation between uh, those facilities and decreased spread of the plague? Well, there, uh, Roman, running water was a Roman invention, and under, under Rome, one had running water. Uh, powered by aqueducts, but uh, in the Renaissance, uh, there was not running water, but there were, uh, there was a focus on cleaner water, on, on purifying wells. Uh, there was a focus uh, on not throwing your waste, uh, your night waste, uh, out windows, and then fines for doing so. So there was increased attention to what one could control, mostly around personal behavior. So if there wasn't running water, that means people then took their waste outside in the morning or something and poured it in the gutter? What would they do? Uh, again, uh, among the things I'm not expert about is Renaissance waste, uh, but, I, uh, <laughs> uh, Darn. but I, I would imagine that uh, there were uh, daily visits outside the town uh, to dump one's waste. Now, you said that the plague there began. Were public sewers. There, were, there were, in some cases, public sewers. Okay. Uh, can you so describe again the very beginning of the plague in summary, and then it spread, you said that originally it was the Gen Genovese uh, merchants who traveled from the Middle East? Where did it start? It, it, uh, it, it's been debated. Some people think it started in China and traveled down the Silk Road with the Mongol hordes. Um, uh, as the climate got colder, um, rats uh, uh, began to migrate westwards towards Europe in, in searching warmer climes and better food. Uh, and uh, so the plague was believed to have uh, traveled with the Mongol hordes uh, and other, other mass migrations down the Silk Road uh, to places like uh, Crimea. Uh, you know, from whence it's, it's it widely spread to Europe, mostly on ships. So what about the plague in Asia and Asia Minor, India? Um, we have reports that there was plague in Asia. Uh, again, uh, less well, less well uh, preserved as, 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 as us. And again, there are debates about whether the plague, uh, where the plague actually started, how far up the Silk Road it started. Um, our, thing, our records are, are fragmentary. Not everybody was as anal retentive as the Florentines uh, about keeping meticulous records or the Venetians. 
So what what was the percent of the po European population which was Catholic at this time? Uh, well, in Europe? Yes. Apart Europe. from dissenters and heretics and Waldensians, uh, I would say it was probably 95%. Um, most of the heretics uh, uh, lived uh, uh, lived in places like uh, Bohemia uh, in, uh, in, and mostly in southern France. Uh, the, the Languedoc, the uh, area around Lyon, uh, was, uh, 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 pardon me, the, the southern France around Marseille uh, was a well-known site uh, for heretics since the 12th and 13th centuries. Multiple crusades tried to wipe, wipe them out for their heretical views. They were called um, dualists, believing in absolute uh, uh, repudiation of the body and trying to lead an entirely spiritual life, believing the body, sex, eating meat is profoundly evil. Uh, and uh, th that was a major Christian heresy. But 95% of the population, at least, uh, were Catholic in Western Europe. So while many of us are fans of, you know, Florence, the Medici, and that part of the Renaissance, actually, what cities, what cities fared best during the play? Well, the, the more organized the city, the more they're able to impose control and surveillance and quarantine and build lazaretti. Uh, so certainly the more organized cities uh, were able, but again, um, I don't know a major difference in death rates um, between town after town. And again, imagine yourself, um, you know, we, we, we did have, you know, primitive mail services. There, there was lots of communications between neighboring towns. Understand what happens if you suddenly re realize that a town uh, not too far away like Luca is now suffering the plague. And you're a Florentine uh, just waiting for death to come, just waiting for death to come. A few of you like Boccaccio's de Cameron could escape the city to country houses and villas and escape that way but most people were just waiting uh, for the inevitable. Imagine the terror you must have felt. Very much like we awaited COVID uh, hitting California. So were there any champions um, during this period who seemed to do better or cause benefit to others by the play? Right now, New York Governor Cuomo is looking like a savvy champion because he governed the state in an effective way to decrease the number of infections and death. Were there similar champions during the Black Plague? Not to my, not, not that I'm aware of. Again, we didn't understand what it was. Um, we had only the most primitive means of tracking it. We ultimately created Books of the Dead, uh, but this, this is a development that takes place not immediately. So we're learning, we're learning mostly how to look for early diagnosis, signs of the plague uh, hitting the town so one could take corrective action. Um, there, were, there were physicians and heads of public health boards who I guess you could call champions. Uh, who did exercise power and control to limit the spread of the plague. Uh, we, you know, many towns had their equivalents of Dr. Fauci. So give us the metrics of the economic impact. Essentially, was trade decreased and that, that affected um, economic impact? What, what effectively were the underlying causes of economic decline during the plague? Well, the, um, I wouldn't say so much economic decline uh, because you know, for the middle, middle classes and the merchant classes, that this is a time of great social mobility. The average wage uh, of, of wages went up 40%, and, and sometimes immediately after the plague. From when to when? When you say age. Went from 40% from, from 1348 to 1360, what do you mean? Yeah, something, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so there was an attempt to reintroduce feudalism and serfdom that was fought by peasants. Peasants could now uh, trade their labor wherever they got the best offer. Uh, they were in short supply. Uh, and uh, there's a whole new market uh, for middle class luxury uh, in towns. So this is really the golden age of the middle class. Uh, and a trade soared. Uh, you know, once you can figure out how to, how to do quarantines, uh, the volume of trade did not go down, uh, but you're trading different kinds of things. So what you're trading now is uh, you're trading, for example, in Italy, mass produced silk. You're trading higher order cloth. You're trading uh, more luxury goods uh, and less raw, raw stuffs. So what, what is traded changes, um, um, but uh, the Florentines, the Venetians, the Genoese become you know, very, very, very wealthy uh, as they had before. On, on the basis of trade mostly is what you're saying. On the basis of trade on manufacturing. Uh, in Northern Italy, you had a system of manufacture of wool and silk was every bit as complicated as our modern manufacturing. You had specialization, 
Uh, you had different uh, you had different workshops doing different kinds of tasks. Uh, from some dyed, some sewed, uh, uh, you know, some uh, uh, some cut garments, and it was the the wool cutters, the uh, the, the stage that revolt, the Trompe revolt in Florence. Um, so uh, you had very very modern forms of uh, proto industrial organization. So for those who survived the plague, life was much better. The people who did not survive well were the traditional noblemen who lived on rents from their land. And as those land, as the rents go down, uh, many of them, you know, merge with the middle class, become a, a solid uh, patrician governing class, no longer uh, a, 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 a urban patrician, a, a rural patrician. They move to towns and become, uh, become urban as well. So what was longevity like, you know, before the plague? Let's say it's 16... For 1340, what, how long did people live in those days? Well, if you lived until your 30s, that was considered a long life, primarily because infant mortality was so high. So on average, uh, you know, living into the 30s was considered uh, certainly middle age. Living into your 40s and 50s was considered old age. But plenty of people did live uh, into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. So median age of death in that era? M median age of death? Um, because again, it depends on which which generation. But uh, during the during the second half of the 14th century, when the plague hit hard, the median age of death would have been pretty low, uh, given how many young people died. As many as 50 percent of the deaths or more uh, were young people. So the average age of death and the median would have fallen. You mentioned isolation of the poor. Why were the poor isolated, or what? Tell us about that process. Again, because the things you do notice is that um, disease is spread by bad sanitation. It's, it's spread uh, by people who can't keep up their clothing or their personal hygiene. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it, is, it is spread by poverty. And therefore, you will create, you know, you, uh, in Florence, for example, uh, there was massive uh, urban development going on across the 14th and 15th centuries as the poor were pushed out in the periphery as middle class and wealthy housing came to dominate the urban centers. Uh, so just like in contemporary life, the poor were pushed into the periphery of cities uh, where they congregated and there was somewhat less, somewhat less mingling of classes, uh, but there still was plenty of mingling. Now, you made a reference a couple of times to Truckee in the bubonic plague. Uh, for those uninitiated in the uh, fine connection between Truckee and the plague, uh, elucidate us. Um, so this is this is not something peculiar to Truckee, but Truckee, you know, is is uh, you know a third a, a third uh, two thirds of the way up to Tahoe, and, and every ten fifteen years, uh, uh, public health authorities catch rats that are carrying the plague bacillus. Much, again, so it's an, it the plague is endemic uh, in certain geographies, in the in it, it in, in areas uh, on the Silk Road, it turns out that the plague was probably endemic there as well. Um, waiting, uh, waiting for certain uh, confluence of forces, uh, the, the existence of, of fleas, the existence of rats uh, to, to, to spread anew. Uh, today, if you catch the plague, it's easily cured with, with uh, antibiotics like tetracycline. In summary, the effect of the plague was, give us the three top bullet points. The, the impact of the plague was first, uh, a, a increasing power of the state. Um, second, the rise of middle-class institutions, and, and more importantly, a rise of a middle-class mentality, uh, focusing on the natural world, on the study of ourselves, on the study of human emotion, on history, uh, on science. That was, those were the, uh, the, the long-term impacts and a corresponding decline in older ways of viewing the world, less theologically. Religion was very important, but it was personal, less institution, institutional, it set the groundwork for the Protestant Reformation because of a significant decline uh, in respect for the church. Uh, that church, the church comes back into, into power and respect in the second half of the 16th century and beyond with the Catholic Reformation. Um, but it took several hundred years for the church to recover its status and standing. Uh, so I, I would say wholesale shifts in power in mentality uh, and uh, not all moving in one direction as well. As you saw, the rise of Savonarola, a, a reaction against secularism, a reaction against humanism, a reaction against worldly honor, a reaction against wealth. Uh, 
Okay, having looked back for a moment, now let's look into your crystal ball. Give us the three most important long-term effects of the COVID-19 crisis on culture in, America, in the world. I wish I could. Again, uh, I'm, I'm cop out wrong by saying, as an historian, I can forecast the past. I can't forecast the future. <laughs> Good say. As an American, as a citizen, I am, uh, I, I am very fr afraid of what the new consensus might be. I'm very much afraid we're going to be less free, less prosperous, uh, less open uh, in the years after COVID. I, I hope not. Uh, but but uh, you know, given my knowledge of what happened uh, during the Renaissance, the Reformation, the French Revolution, uh, I am not sanguine uh, about the near-term impacts. Long-term, we are awesome at muddling through. Um, uh, uh, Short-term, uh, I think we're in for some, some mess, a messy decade. Thank you for joining us with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Our guest speaker today has been Ron Weissman who got a PhD from UC Berkeley and went on to become a professor of medieval and Renaissance uh, history at the University of Maryland. He thereafter became a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley and uh, now spends most of his energy on angel investing. He's written two books on the Italian Renaissance and he shared his thoughts with us today. Uh, we we're very, very happy to have uh, you give us this historic insight into uh, what is the biggest basically disaster uh, globally at this time. Uh, thanks very much, Ron. Thank you very much for joining the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And with that, our luncheon is adjourned. <laughs>